This is my farm. Don't come out here and tell me what I need. I need solutions at work and market options that are worth my time. Small town support that sees the bigger picture. A global network that empowers us. A co-op that's there for us every day. Thank you for joining us here on agripulse.com. We're joined today by USDA Farm Program Undersecretary Bill Northey. And uh, Mr. Undersecretary, I know it's been, uh, been a busy couple of days, a busy couple of weeks, uh, really, as you, uh, you and the, some other folks in the department looked to launch the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. But, but I'm interested because we, we heard some kind of initial high-level numbers on this program uh, uh, last, last month. Uh, we heard that it was a $19 billion program with $16 billion in direct payments to producers. But uh, this week, we saw the actual uh, programmatic details, what producers are actually going to need to do and how, how these payments are going to work. But I'm interested in, in, in some of the behind-the-scenes conversations between now and then. What, what changed between you know, the initial rollout, the initial passage of the CARES Act, really, and today's announcement that we're seeing on some of these more specific details? Well, certainly a lot of details had to come together. You can imagine uh, the challenge here is we're trying to figure out how to put a package together that works for, you know, feeder cattle and catfish and watermelons. And so the challenge of trying to figure out how do you categorize perishables, which I would argue livestock is a perishable if you're trying to, trying to you know, if, if it's a 1,400 pound steer and you don't want it to be a 1,600 pound steer, um, it just as, as uh, watermelons are, but, but corn, Maybe it didn't sell, so you operate that a little different. You have an inventory number versus an actual sales number. So we had to put frame around that, continue to have to figure out what the numbers were going to be, um, uh, trying to look at losses. And frankly, until you have a final beginning date and end date, um, it's hard to figure out exactly what that reduction in value even is. So. So it can be a challenge to pull all those pieces together, to be able to listen to folks that say, hey, we're different this way, and everybody is different, and it is important to understand those. Um, and then finally, at some point, say, we know these, we don't know these. You know what? For the ones we don't know, we're going to have a notice of funds availability announcement. We're going to let them provide us information. And I don't know what the price of maple syrup did. I'm hearing that it went down from the folks selling maple syrup. Tell us why you think that and why that was coronavirus related. And let's give you time. But I don't want to hold up uh, beef cattle uh, because we haven't figured out maple syrup yet. So we want to be open to everything. Um, but some of that's going to require some more information. And so we'll have a a NOFA process open for the next 30 days um, as soon as that gets in the Federal Register in the next day or two that'll provide us uh, more information on more commodities. Tell us about your logic here. You're prorating these payments, um, holding back 20% of what an eligible um, uh, producer is supposed to get with a, and saying that you'll uh, provide that 20% may, may provide that later, depending on if you have enough money available. What was your logic at uh, holding back the, the 20% uh, s specifically? And at what point do you expect to be making a decision about whether you can uh, provide the rest of that? Yeah, so Philip, I, I, you know, uh, I think we have great estimates uh, for the amount of losses, and I think we've got enough money to cover the losses. But frankly, some of this is extremely hard to predict. You know, MFP can be hard to predict, uh, but that was known numbers. We kind of knew how much grain was out there. We knew what production was. Here we're talking specialty crop losses. What do we know about what didn't get delivered and what may qualify? What a payment limit impacts on specialty crops? And so there's a lot of unknown here. And, and knowing that, especially with the NOFA, commodities. Mm -hmm. Some of those are, we're not going to have information ready for the application of those until at least 30 days from now, maybe longer than that, because we may just get the information in 30 days. And so it may be 45 days. They need to have equal access 
to an application and make sure that they're paid. I don't know. It may be partway through this process that we look and we say, our estimates are great. We're going to have 100%. Let's cut the rest of this loose. We don't have to wait for the rest of the applications uh, to get this out. This money is needed. We want to get it out as soon as we can. But it is important to be able to have enough money so that we know that somebody that, because either they have to become eligible through our process or they have to get us information about where their commodity fits. And even if their application is delayed, they have an equal shot at being able to get paid out of this process as well. As I read uh, uh, the rules that uh, you put out, you've got a hard limit on this of $16 billion. Why is that? And because you've got another $14 billion that becomes available in the CCC as of uh, July. Why not dip into that? Yeah, so uh, number one, this is the dollars that we had. This is, this is what we wanted to go forward. We actually have even two buckets here. We have a $9.5 billion of CARES Act and a $6.5 billion of CCC. And so typically our CARES Act money is going for the losses we saw in the last three months. So it's the, first, it's the sales portion of livestock. Uh, not the inventory portion that comes out of CCC. So we actually have to keep those buckets or keep track of those buckets separately. And so that's really why we've got to manage the money. We, we not only do not go over 16 billion, but we need to not go over nine and a half billion um, or the six and a half billion. Um, we don't know what we would want to use that money for. We also have some certainly some bills to pay with that money come October if we decide to keep that around. We certainly don't know what Congress wants to do between now and then. They recognize losses are bigger than $16 billion. And I think there's a lot of conversation about what gets added to this, whether it's new dollars, whether it's them telling us to use that $14 billion, but if they do, better find a way to be able to make ARC PLC and CRP payments and have marketing assistance loans as well. Too. So they're going to provide some signal in what happens next. Right now, we need to design a program that fit this $16 billion. Let's go with it. And then let's figure out uh, for other losses whether there ought to be other programs, either an add on here. Maybe there's even different criteria that folks will say this just doesn't work for everything like it should. This was fine for then, but it's not fine going forward. We have no protection on 2020 crops here um, and the impact on 2020 crops, which I think makes sense while people are still planning. But at some point, Congress is going to say there's an impact on 2020 crops as well down the road. Yeah, the Democratic bill was uh, was written, the one that uh, passed last week was written to cover post-April 15th losses. Is that, uh, did you have that in, in mind that this, that uh, there might be a second round uh, that would uh, provide more beyond what you were doing in the 16 billion? Well, we, we needed to use whatever we had, and we used everything that we had. We had six and a half billion balance left, barely, out of CCC, and nine and a half billion, and we could use 16. So we were using everything that we had. Um, now we were getting requests for much more than that. We saw commodities come in, at, you know, uh, saying they could use all of that or use at least all of one or t- of, other, of those pools. I think we probably had, you know, north of $40 billion worth of requests. And when I looked at most of those, most of them were very realistic uh, in the requests that they had. Some of them were out farther. Um, there's a lot of losses here. We're not the only ones hearing that. The Hill's hearing that too. Certainly back in April when we set the time frame of April 15th, uh, we didn't know a a, 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 Senate, or, or a a House Democrat bill was going to going to say April fifteenth, um, but we knew what we needed to do to be able to get a rule. I remember when the when some of this language first came out, some of the higher level things, and, and it mentioned that livestock was going to be covered. I remember having some conversations and and, and some in, internal thoughts, uh, frankly wondering if USDA was going to look to cover this on a sales basis or on an inventory basis on some of these, some of these livestock figures. And in in looking through the language that came out, 
it, it appears that you're doing both with, with sort of an April 15th cutoff. I'm wondering if you can just kind of walk us through the department's rationale for, for sort of that dual functionality in that program. Yeah, so for livestock, as you say, we're really trying to do a little bit of both. Uh, we cover a greater proportion of the sales losses. We have, we're looking at the sales losses during that period of time and saying 80% of that. On the inventory value, the drop in inventory value, we're only covering 25% of the loss. So um, uh, it, is, it is not fully covering the loss in the value of those animals that are still on the farm. Now, again, there may be future programs that decide to cover that. We do think there's a little time before, before folks realize those losses. We wanted to cover as much of the hard losses with that nine and a half billion that we could. Um, and then we'll see what the next stages are. Uh, we know there's impacts and this impact is certainly greater than these dollars. But this is a way to get them out and, and get some help to folks and a little bit of help on the inventory value piece. But a lot of, uh, you know, there, there are some producers that say, you know, I'm, I'm told or I have been told for the last few uh, few years to, you know, in borrowing some terminology from the MFP conversation, you know, don't expect an MFP payment plant to the market to do what you would do under normal circumstances. And there are some producers that, uh, that perhaps held on to livestock past that April 15th date, uh, allowing for that same advice to be taken. I guess your, your advice, your, your counsel on just kind of getting through, you know, the, the head scratching that some folks might be doing on, you know, abiding by the market, but also perhaps being I don't want to go as far as to say punished, but there are, there are certain ramifications for holding past that date. Um, there, there certainly are. We had to have a, a finished date as well. And we could all argue that if we set the date two weeks from now, there'd be a, you know, there'd be a reaction by folks uh, for that. And whenever we set that date, there's going to be some folks that hold it before or after that. I think for the most part, um, you know, other than feeder cattle, that they probably had a choice on. Most fat cattle, they tried to move it as soon as they could. They were not holding the market thinking, I'm gonna find a way to get paid by the government. Uh, they were just trying to move cattle uh, when that plant would open up. Um, so, and, and I don't know, um, certainly if somebody still had an animal on hand uh, come April 16th, um, then that may create a, you know, a, a inventory payment it won't be as much as what a payment for a sales loss would be again i have no idea what future programs are or aren't going to do um, we needed to develop a program that although short of the real losses could get moved uh, we did have some folks that said you know wait wait until you see what this really is well we'd be announcing a program about a year and a half from now to really understand what that full impact was. I think it was good to get out what we could, have it be recognized as either enough or not enough, and then have folks um, be able to make a decision what they needed to do to fill in the holes uh, that this program creates. And so we'll see what comes next, Spencer. Mm -hmm. There's also some language in, uh, in, the, uh, in the final rule that uh, discusses some self-certification. Wondering, uh, you know, I, I believe you and I have had the conversation before about some concerns within uh, FSA staffing levels nationwide. Wondering any, any concerns uh, or any, any audit plans uh, regarding that self-certification given where FSA staffing levels are already and also asking them to, to implement a, a $16 billion direct program on top of that as well. Yeah, we very purposely tried to make this as simple as we could uh, and, and yet be reflective of the real losses out there. So we, want, we want to collect how many animals were sold between uh, January 15th and April 15th, not at what pounds and at what price and compare that to a reference price or lots of other things. That would create a lot more work for our producers, a lot more work for our counters. Let's figure out the number of animals in certain categories and a payment rate, and then let's multiply. Uh, so we needed to manage that. Uh, we certainly don't want all the paperwork that backs up bin measurements and grain settlement sheets. Uh, we need a inventory number from a producer on grain. 
So it saves us a lot of time at the application stage. We will audit and we will check to make sure uh, we will have these applications go through county committees and they're going to look and say, Spencer doesn't have 10,000 head of cattle. What's going on here? And so there will be some other ways to be able to check through the process, but we will have audits either by FSA staff or others that can help us audit. Certainly on the specialty side, we may use AMS to be able to help us look at that too. We expect very few to give us uh, not correct numbers, uh, but we also want folks to know that we will audit and they have that risk and they don't want it give us incorrect numbers, they need to give us correct numbers. Last question is going to be the easiest one. What should producers, should, what should producers be doing now? Well, they certainly should uh, run to or, or pop up uh, the farmers.gov slash uh, C, uh, CFAP uh, to be able to look at that information, uh, recognize the different categories that we're talking about there. So if they had uh, cattle that they sold, uh, they want to separate their feeder cattle into the below 600 pounds and, and above 600 pounds categories, and then they just need the numbers. Um, so start to gather those records that would represent what that is. And then come the first of the next week, we'll have offices open. Again, they don't have, we'll have to rush in the first day, uh, but we'll have our forms online. And so we'll have forms, we'll have a calculator online too where if you fill out that calculator by these different categories, it'll have information about what should be included in those, calc in those categories. You fill that out, it'll actually fill out a form for us. We don't have it connected yet to the web so that that can automatically upload, but you can print it out, you can sign it, you can send it in, um, and we'll load it into our system. Um, and be able to get that information uh, as quickly and easily. Um, recognizing that many of our offices are not open uh, for visits right now anyway. Uh, so we need to do this by phone uh, or electronically for folks. We'll have a lot of phone calls. Uh, we're even looking at trying to stand up other ways to make sure that we have more people answering the phone uh, for that kind of, um, certainly the questions that'll be out. Appreciate producers' interest and, and awareness, and feel free to ask questions, and we'll have a place where folks can ask questions as well. And thanks for getting the word out. Fair enough. Well, we <laughs> certainly appreciate the time uh, that you're taking to spend with us here uh, under Secretary. And uh, for uh, Phil Brasher and Under Secretary Bill Northey, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one.